Council, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce a guest speaker to you, Professor Tony Vinson. Tony's career has alternated between academic appointments, government and community positions. He has held appointments at the University of Newcastle, the University of New South Wales, and has held visiting professorships in Sweden and Holland. In the early 1970s, Tony was Foundation Director of the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research within the New South Wales Department of Attorney General and Justice. From 1979 to 1981, he headed the New South Wales Department of Corrective Services during a period of intense reform following a Royal Commission into the state's prison system. In 2001, Tony chaired an independent inquiry into public education in New South Wales. In recognition of that contribution, he received an inaugural New South Wales Government Award for Meritorious Services to Public Education. Conference, that inquiry had wide-ranging impact on all of our schools and our professional lives. Tony's inquiry did so much for public education that we should pay him a great tribute for that. In 2008, he was admitted to the Order of Australia and made a member of the Australian Social Inclusion Board. He's an emer emeritus professor of the University of New South Wales, an honorary professor in the Faculty of Education and Social Work in Sydney University, and he's also a life member of the New South Wales Teachers Federation. Tony, we'd love to welcome you to provide our address this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's good, it's good. Uh, colleagues, it's uh, wonderful to be back in the company of people performing one of society's most important roles privileged to be here. Now I understand that you have already a copy or in your possession the recommendations of your working party on an inclusive system of provision. So my role for the next 15 minutes is to provide a background commentary which will be supportive of the general direction of the proposed initiatives. Uh, I won't have time of course to examine each one in detail. When we step aside from our day-to-day -day roles and reflect upon the linkage, linkages between different fields of social endeavour, we recognise how well we educate children and young people with special needs has consequences stretching well beyond the education system. Our efforts and achievements are a measure of our present-day fidelity to values of fairness towards and respect for each individual that have long been aspirations of our Australian society. Also, our collective self-interest is affected. A life that affords opportunities is a life more likely to contribute to the common weal. Sometimes the fresh eyes of an outsider sees things to which those habituated to a situation may have grown accustomed as part of a long established scene. In the initial independent public education inquiry in 2002, but especially a follow-up a few years later, which focused on public preschools uh, in disadvantaged areas, I was shocked by the prevalence and degree of language difficulties, the inability to articulate words to engage in expressive and receptive communication, which I encountered among a surprising number of preschoolers. In the late stages of a professional career, which I think was outlined as I was coming up the steps, uh, focused on lives that had gone seriously awry, I was encountering, I thought, the springs from which so many of the problems I'd witnessed in other fields had issued what might be described as the classroom to jail pipeline. Equally sad was the discovery of the very limited availability of professional services, which if brought to bear in a timely fashion, 
offered promise of benefiting speech-impaired children before they embark on more formal schooling. Invariably, help, if it was available at all, was 18 months or more away in a community health centre, because in a majority of instances, parents were unable to use private providers whose services were beyond the financial reach of many families. My observations at the time received, I must say, a good public airing. And there were many expressions of support for the importance of preventing language difficulties casting a long shadow across subsequent learning. There was support for the incorporation within the Education Authority of speech practitioners to guide the endeavours of classroom teachers and to provide direct services to, ch uh, to children in need of such attention. To see what progress had been made, I took advantage of the opportunity in 2011 to survey the principals and teachers directly involved in public preschools around the state. A majority of the 51 schools that responded were in not well-off areas. Half were located in localities that I had earlier determined were the 20% most disadvantaged places in New South Wales. The results were an indictment of the existing arrangements. Asked specifically to rank aspects of the operation of their preschools that caused the greatest difficulty in achieving the goals necessary for the children enrolled, the three difficulties most frequently mentioned by the principals and teachers were one, gaining support for children with a disability, two, delays in obtaining specialist services for children's speech problems, and three, delays in obtaining specialist services for other health problems. The situation simply had not improved. Indeed, it may have gone backwards in some locations. I recently read an announcement from one local health district announcing, and I quote, that referrals for speech therapy will no longer be accepted for children who are referred in terms three or four of kindergarten or who are in year one or above. Many of the responses to the 2011 survey were reminiscent of the findings of the independent inquiry, what was that, nine years earlier. None more so than this statement. We have a lot of students with speech issues that are not identified until they're enrolled in preschool. The waiting list for speech services is many months and can extend into years. Now at stake, I believe, is nothing less than a test of our claimed belief in giving every child a genuine chance to succeed in life. While the assessment of speech difficulties is sometimes manageable, an 18 months wait for therapeutic intervention negates the whole intent of laying down a good foundation for formal schooling. Many principals and teachers believe that the only sure way forward is to locate speech pathologists within clusters of schools so that they can provide the necessary direct services to children in need of that help and work in a concentrated way as partners with early childhood educators. We're told, are we not, that the age of enlightenment, entitlement, entitlement <laughs> is over. It's over. <laughs> Uh, perhaps just at that moment in our history when one dared to hope that justifiable individual and group entitlement to just treatment was beginning to receive careful attention. Instead, we're encouraged to retreat from weighing the inevitably many-sided, complicated nature of social issues and take up membership of camps constituted on the basis of slogans. Now, fortunately in our state, there are groups willing and able to conduct logical and moral analyses of existing social arrangements. And I do place the report of Federation's Inclusive Education Policy Working Party in that category. It advances without accepting the universal correctness in all circumstances of a single approach, 
a strong argument in support of arrangements that furnish young people with disabilities and those who teach them with the means of performing to the best of their ability. A much heard political refrain of the day is that governments can't guarantee equality of outcome, only equality of opportunity. And that, I believe, is precisely what the policy proposals before you today seek to promote. Avoiding the mind-dulling effect of slogans needs to be matched by equal care in the interpretation of what we might call virtuous terms, like social inclusion. This term has been flexibly interpreted, but its core connotations include access to the resources, material and personal, required for participation in the social, economic and political activity of society as a whole. No single measure or program can assuredly overcome the obstacles that block people's opportunities for social inclusion. The Working Party argues convincingly that maximising opportunities for social inclusion is the appropriate policy goal, not the unwavering observance of a single approach in all circumstances. The position taken by the Working Party and outlined in, in its detailed paper is that schools are inescapably a participant in the formation of citizens capable of living a fulfilling life that expresses their values and their choices. Students with a disability share these aspirations and are entitled to equal access to the educational resources, uh, skilled personnel, timely specialist interventions, inclusive curriculum, and appropriate specialised settings, resources that facilitate their personalised learning. Their delegates, in a nutshell, and backed by national legislation, you have the essentials and guiding principles of a fair schools policy with respect to young people living with disabilities. My own research on the geographic distribution of cumulative disadvantage across New South Wales manifested in a web of financial poverty, unemployment, mental health problems, trouble with the law and the like, shows that the rate of disability benefits is among the best predictors of concentrated disadvantage in a locality. And paralleling these findings was the discovery in the course of the, inqui <coughs> excuse me, the inquiry of major differences in the distribution of students on funding support in mainstream classes. In Western and Southwestern Sydney, one third, one third of all schools had 20 or more students with disabilities in mainstream classes, compared with 1% of schools in Northern and Southern Sydney. In arriving at a balanced judgment of these issues, it has to be said that in recent decades, disability issues have more frequently been conceived of in terms of rights rather than welfare. In our independent inquiry report, we noted a remarkable increase in the number of students with disabilities in mainstream classes. Just let me say a brief word at this point about uh, one of the founding figures of modern sociology, Robert Merton. He observed that society takes constructive action to remedy a situation when the issue is redefined as corrigible. When evidence exists that it's capable of transformation by concerted, informed action. In New South Wales, a chain of structural changes, the closure of some institutions, the growth of schools for specific purposes, life skills courses, the number of students with disabilities in general education settings, surely these things testify to some increase in the perceived feasibility of affording increased life opportunities for students with disabilities. These structural improvements, I believe, are appropriately acknowledged by the Working Party, which asserts that participation in mainstream schooling, provided the requisite instructional and other resources are available, generally, generally best assists the development of the junior citizen. However, a small but significant number of cases characterised by poor educational experiences and outcomes 
serves to remind us that meeting young people's special needs is not a case of one size fits all. Time constraints don't permit me to review in detail all of the proposals that the Working Party considers necessary for our system to fulfil its obligations to young people living with disabilities. However, a first requirement is the ability to bring to bear specialist support in mainstream public schools and SSPs, speech pathologists, clinical psychologists, among others. I think that a decade of waiting for constructive action is long enough. It's time, surely, for action. We should start by emulating the practice of those states that incorporate speech therapists within the educational authority. A priority should be ensuring that such services are available before speech and related difficulties impede more formal learning. The same is true of the need for detection and treatment of early onset psychological problems. The challenging behavior and aggression of some students can be obviously perplexing and confronting to their teachers and their fellow students. In one case, I tested the waters by trying to encourage mental health backup for one troubled school which had resorted to the creation of a wire fence enclosed compound for the segregation of difficult to understand and control pupils. My initial shock, being an ex-chief screw for New South Wales, my initial shock at the adoption of a measure seemingly more appropriate in a penal establishment mellowed as I discovered the unavailability of mental health backup services for the school. 12 years later, I'm given to understand that the, those circumstances remain substantially unaltered. I remain as impressed today by the overall performance of public school teachers and the educational achievements of mainstream public schools as I was at the time of the independent inquiry. However, I endorse the Working Party's claim that a truly inclusive system of education needs to provide differentiated quality specialist services for a relatively small percentage of special needs students. <laughs> students for whom mainstreaming is not an effective answer. The overdue perception of the corrigibility of the goal of cultivating the broad citizen attributes and capacities of young people with disabilities does not lead automatically to the necessity or desirability of adopting a uniform path. There is a higher order principle involved, matching students to those arrangements which provide quality education and support the attainment of the student's human potential. It's hard to disagree with the Working Party's conclusion that specialised settings which make specific quality teaching adjustments for students with complicated needs are part, part of a socially inclusive public education system. And I conclude with these sentiments. The human costs of a life path that shunts people into dead end bays are sufficient to warrant effective national remedies. The great economic costs associated with disability, dependence, and correction, traceable in so many lives to a bad start and sustained educational failure, should make assuring the best possible start for every child an extremely high social priority. Unless we're reconciled to a future in which some individuals have disadvantage piled upon disadvantage from the beginning of their lives, and an ever-increasing number of human disposal institutions to contain the inevitable consequences, we must insist on a high quality and adequately funded approach to the education of our children living with disabilities. Our sense of justice, our obligations to all of our children demand nothing less. Thank you.
Conf conference. Tony is available for a short period of question time if anyone has any questions. Are there any questions? I can't see anybody. Um, Tony, on behalf of conference, could I thank you very much for your contribution today. Um, obviously from the audience's reaction, it was very helpful to our discussions, but also for your contribution over so many years to so many campaigns for our students in public schools, public preschools, for education generally, and for social justice. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> Jenny has a small bit. <laughs>